Welcome to the Painting Insights podcast. We have been working on something in the background. That's right. We've actually started a Patreon channel. For the last couple of months, we've had previous guests revisit the channel to give us additional content, everything from studio tours, sketchbook tours, talking us through the process of paintings and all kinds of additional treats, which you're exclusively going to see as a patron who supports the channel. So by supporting us on Patreon, you help the channel keep going. There's a lot of work put into this from the video editing to the sourcing of guests. So you really help us find those guests and to put the content out. And we have lots of uh, content planned for the near future. So the links for that will be in the description of this video and in the description on the podcast channels. And otherwise you can go on to Patreon and type in Painting Insights Podcast and support us that way. Thanks very much, enjoy the video. Okay, so would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? Sure, yeah, I'm uh, David Baird, and um, I'm a painter. And uh, I, I live in the United States. Um, right now I'm in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And, um, you know, I, I also teach painting um, and travel doing workshops and, and that sort of thing. So, Fantastic. Have you always lived in Alabama or is that somewhere you've moved to? Um, I was born in Alabama and I, I grew up here. Like I, I really didn't leave very much, um, growing up. And when I was about 19 or 20, I, um, I moved away to, to study painting. So I, I moved to New Mexico first. And so that was like a big, um, leap for me leaving Alabama. Yeah. Um, but, but no, I mean, my family's here and, and I was born here and raised here so so what was your experience like in new mexico was that good was it challenging what was your recollection of that oh i i mean i i loved it um yeah it was amazing yeah i i went there to study with a, a painter named tony Ryder, who has a his his own studio school and i kind of moved there early um to to just get um uh, you know like installed into um, a place to live there. And so I had, uh, not quite a year maybe to, um, you know, start going to drawing groups and just get familiar with things. And it's beautiful. I, it, it's an amazing place. It's called the land of enchantment. And, um, I was definitely smitten by it for, for a long time. I still, I mean, you know, I, I spent a long time there and um, I mean, there's still something very unique about just the landscape there. And, and then of course having Tony's was, I mean, you know, that was a place to just go and, and, and work a lot. And so there's, there's a, you know, definitely a kind of fondness and nostalgia I have for like my, my early, you know, student days. Mm. Um, Yeah. And did you make connections there? Have you got kind of like a little art connections there as well, as far as other students? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, mostly around Tony's that I've stayed in touch with at, at all. Um, but I, I have a hard time keeping in touch with everyone. I actually, I mean, Tony's was the first stop on on many different um, kind of um, uh, like many different locations that I was in in the States. And then I, I also ended up traveling overseas to study some. Um, and so, so, you know, I always, I meet great people and then, and then lose touch with them, unfortunately. Um, but, but then, I mean, there were people outside of Tony's too. Like I would, I'd go to these drawing groups and, and, you know, I met a lot of artists around, um, that were very, a lot of them very interesting, um, personalities. And, uh, but, you know, I never, I never really, um, had a correspondence with them or anything that, that I would keep in touch, but, um, I hope they're all well and yeah, yeah, of course. You know, still making work. Well, where outside of the States did you travel to? Because that's interesting. Well, um, I started uh, studying at a school called Studio Scalier, which um, is actually, they're kind of artistic relatives of Tony, Tony Riders, um, who was in, who's the artist I studied with in New Mexico. Um, they all studied with a guy named Ted Seth Jacobs, 
And he's from the United States and uh, he taught at the Art Students League for a long time in New York. And eventually, for for whatever reason, he got fed up with living in the United States and, and he just moved to some middle of nowhere place in France. And somehow, like, he he bought a house there and kind of opened a school and, and somehow people would find him back then, you know, this is pre-internet. So um, they would just see, I, I actually, I have no idea, I guess advertisements and little magazines, or I've, I've heard different stories of how um, people um, ended up going there to study, but, you know, he taught a lot of um, artists like Michael Grimaldi study out there. And, um, you know, I think at, at some point Jacob Collins studied with him who opened the grand central atelier. Um, and so, uh, the, the, the school in France that I was working with, um, they also studied with him and kind of studied with Tony some too. And so, um, so there was a kind of a genetic relation there artistically. Um, and, uh, they, they themselves, uh, it's a husband and wife that opened the school and, um, you know, they, uh, they sort of modeled it after what Ted did, but, but I, they, they made it a little more, um, like, uh, they made it a little more, um, comfortable, I guess, like, um, that people could come and, and study there it was a lot more accessible. And then obviously with the internet, you know, it's, it's, uh, that it's, it's a whole different game now, but, um, anyway, it's, it's sort of it, it, not exactly in the middle of nowhere, but kind of, kind of in the middle of nowhere and a very focused environment, very beautiful French countryside. Um, and so, you know, I went there to study and, and eventually they, they asked me to start helping like a work study. Um, and, and now I actually teach there. Um, so, uh, you know, it was a nice sort of progression to, um, you know, more responsibilities. Mm, that's fantastic. And you're sort of part of that lineage of teaching those same, um, that same sort of framework. Are you kind of teaching in the similar, uh, kind of principles that you learn from that? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that, um, I also like I, I have kind of an, an eclectic um, education. So um, so I did I did study with a lot of the, the Ted Seth Jacobs school. Um, but then I, I also have some I have some different influences. And so so there's definitely that that DNA mm -hmm. in there. And, and I, I think there are some like very important things. Um, that I learned there, but, but there's also, there are, there are some other things too, which, which I think is, is a very good thing in my opinion. I mean, um, you know, some, some schools maybe like to keep it all in, in house, but, um, you know, if you, I mean, if you want a, a robust sort of, um, genetic, um, you know, makeup, it's probably good to, to, to cross some, um, outside streams and not just, um, incestuously inbreed mm -hmm. um but yeah so i i mean i think that there are definitely you know principles that are intact from that and then and then there there are some other other things as well um and and so you know um yeah how unorthodox <laughs> does your other practices go are they are they wildly kind of uh abstract or is it kind of you know what, what are we talking about when it comes to a varied genus of genetic makeup what are we talking well yeah I, I mean i i i never have gone fully abstract um i mean the other the other main influence on me was um the jerusalem studio school and israel hirschberg um and sort of more fundamental to what they're doing they, they would talk about abstraction but but they're always working from life um, whether it's a landscape or, or they have a, you know, they have a studio school as well. So, so there's actual um, models. Um, but, but, you know, the, the foundation there, like I would say at, at Tony's and, and Ted's and, and those sorts of schools, um, there's a lot more attention to drawing and, and accurate, an optical kind of accuracy um, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that, uh, you know, proportions and things. And I mean, I say accuracy because, you know, there's, I think there are other kinds of accuracy or, or a different kind of precision that you could talk about that I think is what they're going for in Jerusalem, but the foundation is a lot more abstract. And, 
And the way I think that the, the, the other thing, like with Tony, you, you sort of start with the idea of, you know, there's a figure up there on the model stand and we're going to draw or we're going to paint the figure. Um, but in Jerusalem, you would start with, you know, you've got a painting and it's this, it's a rectangle that's this size. And so what are you going to do in that rectangle to make it interesting? So, you know, it, it has a much more, you're, you're dealing much more on pictorial terms right from the beginning. And, and Tony's was a lot more like, it's almost like a natural scientist, um, you know, trying to understand what he's seeing, you know, the way the, the light interacts with this thing. Um, so there's, there are a lot more conversations about the actual physics of light and, um, and th that sort of thing that, I, I mean, I was, I, I, I was sort of deeply fascinated by both of those things. Um, but, but what appealed me, you know, about Jerusalem was that, um, I mean, in the end, you, you only have the painting and it's always like, you, you can never completely recreate the reality that you're seeing, no matter how hard you study and no matter how much you know about what's going on up there. Um, and even if that were the point would be another question I would, I would raise, but, but in the end, you know, all you have is the painting and it, and it better be interesting. Um, you know, it better do something, you know, to your nervous system that um, is exciting. And, and so I, when I studied in Jerusalem, like you were kind of, um, I mean, Israel, that's, that's the first thing he's looking for. It, nothing else matters. If your drawing's good, like none of that matters. You, you know, it matters if the painting, you know, excites the viewer. Um, and, and so you were kind of given liberty to do whatever it took to make that happen, you know, and, and there are certainly things that they would talk about that they felt like were, you know, good to, to have in a painting. Um, and, and they would encourage that sort of thing, but, but ultimately, you know, it, 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 uh, you know, as a painter, you, you're developing your own personality and it boils down to what, what you find interesting and, and exciting to you. And, um, and, and, you know, I love a good study from life. I, I, I mean, like, a you know, some of these, uh, there are more and more of these atelier type schools that are opening up, you know, and they, they teach this really hard nose, like rigorous kind of drawing. And I, I mean, I love what I see there, but then at the same time, you know, that's, I mean, I see that as a, as an exercise, as a good learning experience. Um, so then, you know, but what are you going to do with it? Like, can you put it into some bigger context that, you know, that it has, um, you know, that it has that excitement to it, you know? Yeah. I had this conversation recently with a fellow art teacher who um, she's very strict about um, trying to use the reference, you know, kind of to, to get accuracy to an extent. And then I tried to discuss with her about taking artistic liberties and how important those decisions are and to free yourself from the kind of constraints of a reference. Because if you can get accuracy, yeah then surely you can inject emotion and movement and all types of things that a reference won't offer. So uh, is that the type yeah. of thing you're talking about? Really? I mean, I think so. And that that's where it becomes very, it becomes very tricky because, um, you know, it sort of just comes down to each individual, like what they, um, I guess what their goals are or what their vision is for, for the work. But, you know, as this is a, you know, I mean, it's, this might be kind of, um, diverging from what you were saying exactly, but like, this is something I, I kind of worry about and I'm not, I'm still not quite sure how to approach as a, as a teacher, because, you know, if you start, if you start saying, you know, that um, it's just a reference or even if it, nature or, or a photograph or whatever is just a reference. And then, you know, what the, the main thing is, a, is the painting, you know, then, then there starts to be a certain amount of like, um, you know, if you're giving a critique, you know, they might just say, well, I liked it better that way. Or, you know, you might be critiquing something about, you know, the proportions or which, which that's totally, that, that's the thing that, I mean, I, I kind of get that. And, um, you, you know, the, the, at a certain point, you, you know, you want people to, I mean, I would imagine, I mean, people can take whatever liberties they want. Um, but the, you know, um, the thing about having a model there and, and critiquing a person's painting, like while the model is there, is that there, there's a degree of objectivity, even though, I mean, I can't say for sure that you and I see exactly the same thing or that the exact colors, you know, that I see are the ones you'll see, but, but there's a degree of objectivity, I think that, that allows you to, um, to, well, that, to have a conversation at least about, you know, what you're seeing and um, what's accurate. What does that even mean? Accuracy. 
Um, but you know, one, one thing I, I remember, um, you know, getting a critique from Israel and, and he mentioned, uh, I don't know if he said the word truth or, or he was talking about a particular color notes I'd mix that, that were true notes that, that ring true. They look like, like really observed, um, you know, just and and believable in that in that regard which they and before they become anything else you know that you have three or four spots of color that they just read like a light effect and it could be a landscape it could be a figure it could be a still life and you know i i remember that that idea was something i kind of latched on to and and even at, at tony's i feel like that was a certain overlap that those those two had um is it you know the to to have that kind of as a foundation that that kind of um ability you know to just to just make a few notes read as light on a on a flat surface uh has like that's sort of become fundamental to what i'm trying to do so before it becomes anything else whatever nameable thing it is you know that that you're able to to and then i mean it's it's a tall order you know to to actually mix those colors you know and get the the value structure and everything right you know, and, and to make it say way more, you know, with just a few of spots. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I think that's probably the most valuable skill that, that uh, a painter or a, a, a painter working sort of perceptually or observational um, would, you know, would want to have. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate what you mean there as well, because I think the conversation I'm having with this fellow teacher, she's more of a mentor to me. So I think part of me is trying to push her to a place right. where she doesn't practice because my brother's a professional right. artist and he said, why paint the sky blue when you could paint it, you know, kind of violet or something. You know, he said, it's up to you. He goes, so right. long as it's tonally accurate, if a fence is brown, you can make it blue. You know, you can do whatever you want that serves the painting sure. because he's talking, yeah. you know, uh, higher, in- intermediate or advanced. Whereas when I'm teaching, I didn't realize I started in the last class to introduce the idea of putting things in boxes, which to me is a mm. fairly basic starting point for drawing things. And the person whose class I was teaching with, because it's this chap's class and I go and teach with him, he said, this might be a bit advanced for them. And I started to realize very quickly that putting things in boxes and moving boxes in space is foreshortening its perspective it's things which they really don't know how to do so i was just saying well i'm just going to introduce you to the principle and then we'll just go with negative space vertical and horizontal markers and flow lines and we'll just keep it with what you're comfortable with for now because i i saw how many frowns that the students had just thinking put it in a box i don't know what put it in a box means and i was trying to say to them you can't see the bottom of the box you know if their head's like that you can only see the top of the box and it was just too much And I think I hadn't realized how advanced perspective is not advanced, but how it for a beginner's class perspective is, is a bit further on down the line mm-hmm. than what, um, what some draw. I mean, some of the drawers there are pretty decent as well, but I don't think that perspective factors into a, a lot of their practice. So some of those ideas, I think uh, it surprised me. Let's put it that way. It was something which I wasn't anticipating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I think I mean to me, perspective is is very like another one of those fundamental things. I, yeah, I mean, it's it's more of like a uh, I guess I would classify it as like a drawing thing, which which doesn't diminish its significance. But um, you know, the the box exercise as well. I mean, that's I think that's crucially important. You know, whether you're doing landscape figure still life, um, you know, to to kind of understand the the geometry of things. Yeah. Um, and then, and then of course, perspective, I, I mean, all of that would, would obviously be a value um, in my opinion to, again, to a, a perceptual painter or, or observation based painter. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, the, um, I, it's i could see uh, is it like a figured painting class or drawing class or is it it's, is yeah, it just drawing, drawing from observation in general? it's drawing still life a lot of the time and it's an interesting okay, yeah you know, it started off as life yeah. drawing when i went there 
Now it's just a drawing class. Yeah. So there's no life model yeah. model now, really. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was something like Tony um, didn't ever really talk about perspective. And, and I sort of developed an interest in it on my own a little bit. I probably influenced some by Michael Grimaldi as well. Um, but, you know, even drawing from the figure, I mean, pretty much anytime I, I'm drawing, um, whether it's it's um, really conscious and deliberate at this point, um, or if it's just sort of built in at this point, but, you know, to, to know where your eye level is, and then exactly like what you're saying, you know, it's, some, it's something above the eye level, you're seeing more, more of the bottom of the box, and then yeah. something's below the eye level, you can see more of the top of the box. And then, you know, if you're drawing a figure, um, you, you know, if you're, if you're sitting all the way across the room, you, you know, it may not be such an issue, but, you know, if you're, if you're kind of usually, you, you know, you end up being kind of closer to the model in, in some of these life drawing groups and, and, you know, there's inevitably, you know, there, there can be a kind of distortion that takes place. Um, and so it's just, it's good to kind of know. And and the other thing, if, if I'm teaching a figure drawing class, this is something I, I cannot get my students to do ever. And I think it probably relates to the, the issue you're having, but, you know, one of the first things I'll try to get them to do is to, is to draw the model stand. Um, or at least to, to incorporate that in as early as possible, because, you know, that's I mean, that's going to tell you all about the perspective and the space. Um, and and it's going to give you something to place the model on. And if, if they're sitting in a stool or, or on a stool or in a chair or something like that, you know, also including that as part of the structure of this thing, because it, their whole gesture is going to be influenced by it. And and so you're you're really I think that's that's a part of like just beginning with first principles and then, and then, um, you, you know, building towards the, the actual object, which is what most people want to focus on. And especially in a, in a still life as well, like why people would think why they need perspective for a still life, but you know, it does influence everything. And, you know, if you're, if you're looking for just that, that, that extra degree of, of, you know, the true kind of believable perceived quality, um, you, you know, it's, it's helpful to know, like what's going on in this space you know yeah. no absolutely um, so it's, it's strange yeah. knowing when people are ready i think it's because i'm i'm not as uh familiar with the beginner class i think people mm. i talked before have understood perspective to an extent the principle but then to teach them one two three point perspective talk about carried horizons it's just really interesting things that seem complex until you just understand them. And then it's, it's simple. It's just, it's just a logic. Right. It's, right. It's reality. Really. Yeah. We will we'll yeah. get it as soon as you understand the terminology usually. Um, right. Yeah. It's interesting. So do you teach, is it exclusively in person or do you teach online as well? I have taught online classes, um, especially, you know, around pandemic time. That's when I um, saw the necessity, obviously, um, and so I, I've done some some of that. I, I don't have anything really like scheduled right now, and it's not my favorite way of teaching. Yeah. Um, so so I kind of uh, I'm not um, chomping at it to to set up those classes. But I I mean it's it's a it's amazing that you could I mean you can work with students across the world in a yeah. single class, and um, and so I definitely I definitely want to do it again and plan on doing it again, um, yeah. but yeah now that everything's opening back up and you can travel you know the the in person i think is um yeah i i often feel like my hands are kind of tied teaching online um but I, I think there's tons you can communicate so you know and there's there's a real value as well to like i'll pre-record demos and so you know i i kind of know what's going to happen and what i can talk about and and that there's going to be something of value at, at the end of that um, in person, you know, sometimes you, you just bomb doing demos and there's the whole <laughs> yeah. like stage fright thing. Um, but, uh, you know, then the, the, I think there's a real value to just being able to pick up a person's brush and mix some color and just show them on their painting, like what happens, you know, if you just change a few things. Um, so, so, you know, they both have, they both have benefits, but I, I definitely feel like the, you know, painting is the sort of thing and drawing is the sort of thing that um, if, if, if at some point you, you can do it in person, you know, you really, you really should try. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I think in person, it's, it's a lot easier to communicate with people for some reason. There's just a, I mean, there's the obvious barrier, obviously of distance and there may be a lag. And, but I, I also, I think it's, I'm sometimes when I've done it, it's been 
just with one-on-one -on -one, uh, clients, it's been a little self-conscious for me. So I'll kind of mm. not know that they've understood. So I'll redraw what I drew or repaint right. it. And I'll have painted it three or four times and they'll be working on their first and they'll say, you don't have to keep doing it. And I'm like, sorry, I'm trying to simplify it over and over again, just to go, here it is. Here's the principle, break it down. Here it is again. And just, I think it's my lack of uh, feedback from the online uh, interaction. That, that, that's, that's the thing you have absolutely no, I'm, I mean, this like, um, you know, you could have 15 or 20 people in a class and, you know, you're, you're talking to a screen and, you know, you have none of those, like right now I can see you nod your head and it's yeah. like, so, you know what I'm talking about, but if you're just, you don't know how something's landed, you know, if, if it makes sense and, and inevitably, you know, as, as articulate as you are, as, as well as you can explain something, you know, there's going to be somebody who, who doesn't quite get it, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't register. And so, um, you know, it's helpful when, when you're in person and you just kind of scan the room and you see people's faces. Um, so, so that's the other thing I, I do find that, I think that's maybe one of the things that, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's exhausting to me to teach online because, uh, you, you know, I, I feel like there's just, just this low level of panic that, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's somebody there who's not going to get this or that yeah. I didn't quite explain it well enough. So yeah, I completely relate to that. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't compare. It is much nicer in person. I think that's what everyone was craving, craving during the lockdowns. And we're really pushing for that yeah. connection again, because it's so important. We're such social species that we really rely on those, uh, kind of connections that are made in person that just can't be replicated. But I do fully agree with you that if you're to do a demonstration, everyone has the same angle. If you can upload a video as opposed right. to having a class that's a circle or semicircle and only some people are seeing, you know, a clear right. view of what you're actually doing. Um, so there's yeah. pros and cons, but I still, I'd still rather go around to little clusters of an in-person class and redo a drawing than to have that right i know what you mean it's kind of i don't know i think there's a lot of benefits there but we sort of briefly touched on it and i'd like to ask you about your color palette that you have do you have a a specific color palette that you use and if you do would you take us through what colors you you use yeah um i, I think that uh, it's it's always it's always changing to some extent but um you know i think i think there are some like um, pretty stable, consistent colors that I'll use, and then occasionally kind of supplement with things. But I, I mean, the the main thing, like most of my palette, my color mixing, um, my the whole conceptual model I have for color is just based on the primaries. So every mixture I make is going to be, to some extent, um, it's going to have ratios of red, yellow, and blue. Um, you know, there are some things that are going to have more blue and and more yellow, red, and um. And, and so, you know, most of, most of my, I mean, I, so for, for my palette, I mean, the, the key thing is just always to have a good red, yellow, and blue. Um, and, and so like, I, I can just go through right now what my palette is and mm. maybe talk a little bit more about that. But, um, so I've, I've got, uh, I, I actually have titanium white on my palette and I also have, um, lead white, um, and, uh, I can talk about why that's important to me, but, um, but then the, the next color would be, um, I actually use like a, a transparent yellow. I think it's just called yellow Lake Michael Harding. Um, and that's a very like center yellow. So it's pretty, pretty much like what you would think of as, as quintessential yellow. And then I, I also have Indian yellow, which is a little more of like an orange yellow, but also a very transparent yellow. Um, and, and right now I'm using, um, yellow ochre. Sometimes I'll, I'll just use raw sienna, but it's just kind of a dirty yellow. Um, and then next I have a, like a cad red or, or, a just a, a, a good center red. Sometimes I use Windsor red also, cause it's, it's just much cheaper. Um, and not presumably not as, as toxic. Although, I mean, I use lead white, so that doesn't really matter, but, um, <laughs> Next, I have I have burnt sienna, um, and then I have uh, I, I actually have quinacridone violet on my palette now, um, and I used to use quinacridone magenta a lot, and which is kind of a, a cooler red, 
um, as opposed to the the cadmium or the Windsor red, which is which is just that that's a more quintessential kind of like center red. Um, but but I, I just found the Cronacridone violet um, is uh, it. it it, it cools things off in a way that I just, I really like the way it interacts with some of the other colors. And um, so I've been using that for, for a while now. Um, next to that would be um, ultramarine blue and then uh, ivory black and then Viridian, I think would be, that would be like my main palette that, that I have. Um, and, and then I'll, you know, I'll add colors in there Um you know, like uh, green gold is a color that that I put on there that I just um, sort of, they're sort of stunt colors. I guess what, what I would say about that is that the, the, the palette I just listed, even even that is a bit extended in, in my mind conceptually. What, what I usually try and do is I'll, I'll try and mix like 80% of the color with a very limited core palette i would say so pro- a lot of the time in the in the space that i work i try and just use either yellow ochre or raw sienna which is my yellow i'll use burnt sienna which is my basically my red and then i'll use either ultramarine or ivory black which is my blue and all of those like those are very very muted colors already and so the main thing i'm i'm just trying to get the the tone right the value right first so if i'm mixing a very light note or a very dark note um, and, and then, you know, if I need to, if I find I need to push that more to the yellow, say, like the reason I like these transparent yellows is because, um, they, you, you can change the hue of the mixture without changing the value very much. Um, so if you were to mix like cadmium yellow into ivory black, you're going to shift the, the value of it way up into the light. And it's going to be kind of like a green, um, chalky kind of green, um, and and if you take that transparent yellow and you mix it with ivory black, it's going to stay black, basically. Um, it's just going to be like this really dark, rich green. Um, and same with the Indian yellow. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of like having some of these um, these transparent pigments to, to modify some of those um, opaque like base notes that I start out with. But for the most part, all, all of these notes I'm, I'm beginning a painting with are um you know they're 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 made with a very very simple ingredients and then and then to get the last like 15 percent or whatever i need out of that note you know i can i can add in some more chromatic note or something like that to it but you know again working from observation and kind of trying to get i however you'd call it like a more sort of naturalistic color um you know you're you're looking at a lot of grays basically um, and, and so, you know, mixing the figure, um, there are definitely areas in the figure, you know, the nose or the lips or something like that, that you might need a little more to pump up the red or, or, um, you know, some, some of those, um, or- oranges and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, 80% of the figure is a pretty like low chroma orange. Um, and, and so, you know, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, can can probably get a lot of that in there the cools you know ivory black or ultramarine um and and so so that's sort of the principle that's based on and um but yeah if i were you know if i were painting lemons or something like that i might put out a cadmium yellow or if i were out in the landscape you know maybe a phthalo blue depends on where i am i guess um you know if, if you have a really intense blue sky um, and so, so I, you know, I, I've got tons of paint that I can put out if I need to, but, but I, yeah, trying to keep, you know, because otherwise I, th- the other thing about if you, if you mix everything with kind of a core palette, there's, there's kind of a built-in harmony to the painting from the beginning. And this, this, a lot of this came from just experimenting with limited palettes because, um, you know, using a limited palette, like, like the, the Zorn palette or, or, um, you know, the, I mean, there are tons of palettes out there, but usually those are based on that principle of you need a red, yellow, and blue, um and white and um you know you you have to learn to kind of suggest what you can that 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 won't get through you know that that kind of the filter that's already there on the palette and so um but but it's a it's an incredible lesson to to experience you know as as a student um when when for instance you can make ivory black read as a blue because it's just surrounded by all these other warm notes 
Um, and, and you, yeah, you'll come to find that, you know, if you, um, if you take into account the context, you know, a lot of times you, you, you know, ivory black would be a suitable blue, you know, especially if you're working with the figure, um, it's just enough to cool it off a little bit so that, you know, you don't want to get like a rainbow figure. You, you want there to be a consistency to it. And so, um, so for the, for the, for the whole painting to have that consistency as well, like I, I would just lose track of, of everything if I were using, you know, all of those colors to begin with. So, so I try and build everything on, on very simple, um, color mixtures and then, and then, and then push them to, you know, to the extreme if, if I need that. Mm. Um, so oh, I, hope, exactly. I hope that makes sense. No, that was fantastic. We, we do love exploring colors and the reasons for colors. And that was absolutely fantastic to hear. I would like you to then go back to why titanium white and then zinc white. So why is it you've got those two? Well, it's, it's lead white and, lead and, um, the zinc that, but that, that, that is interesting because I, I think that like, like a lot of people will use zinc now as a replacement. And, um, I, th I think what lead white and zinc white have in common is that they are more transparent whites. Um, and so, so going back to kind of what, what I was just talking about with the transparent colors. Um, so what's that mean with white when you have a more transparent white? Uh, I mean, usually it's just a weaker, tinter in the mixture um and and so so for instance i mean if you um like i it's a it's a good example with with the whites and and this is the sort of thing that it would it would it would be much clearer if i were to demonstrate you know that you could actually see it so kind of going back to you know having to explain things um yeah. uh, online but you know tit titanium is like a sledgehammer it, you know if you mix it just about with any other color it's it's pretty it can just overwhelm the mixture um, but flake has this subtlety to it that, um, you, you, you know, you, you can just, you can get a, a much more kind of refined color note. And, and then at the same time, when you start to, if you're, if you're blending a lot, you know, or, or, um, you're doing sort of like fine modeling within the painting, you know, the, the, the flake white is, you can, I guess, I mean, I could say you, you can be more heavy handed with how you're doing it, um, but but it's also I, I think you can just you can get a kind of subtlety and nuance that uh, without without like overstraining yourself or or just um, I know with with, with titanium, it, it's just so easy, especially in the in the dark lights. Um, it's just so easy to lose like the the richness of the color and um, and, and lead white retains that so well. And I mean, you know, really, it, it was used by all the painters for forever basically um except for maybe in the 19th century is when titanium came along um and and i mean look like titanium is a great i use it like i said um and it's if you need a good opaque note um you know that's the the color to go to um but but i i mean i think that when you see some some paintings in person you know and that they have this depth to them and richness i i think a lot of that is because of lead white um, and, and so, so usually what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start a painting a lot of time with titanium just to get good opaque coverage and, and, um, you know, to kind of set up the, the color that, that I want. And, and then, you know, as, as the painting progresses, I'll, I'll use flake a lot more, um, to, to get more of that kind of richness and nuance. And, and so, um, so that's sort of the general uh, no, process. Good. Yeah, that's a yeah. great explanation. But there are a couple of wild cards as well as gold green, which I've not come across before as well. What's, where's that come from? Yeah, well, I, I have a friend that that kind of got obsessed with that, and um, and and she recommended it. Um, and she then around, actually, green somebody gold, sorry, you said I think you said green gold. Yeah, green gold. But I, I mean, I think that's what it's. This is a, this is the thing it brings up, and this may not be interesting to anybody but me. But um, you know, from brand to brand. I, the um you know manufacturers will call different pigments different things and and so you can actually look on the back of of the um, paint tubes and you can see they they give a pigment index number um and so for for a red color it would be like pr 102 which means i don't know what the p means i assume it means maybe like pigment but pigment red 102 if it were a blue it would be pb you know 80 86 or whatever 
And, and so that way, you know, um, like one, because if you, if you want to buy green gold now, if you want to go out and buy green gold, which I'm not, I'm not saying it's like going to solve every problem, but um, you know, you might, d depending on what brand you use, like some of them are just a mixture. It might just be like a mixture of Indian yellow and, and phthalo blue. Um, but then some of them are actually like a unique pigment. So it would, I, I'm not sure what the pigment index is for green gold, but, um, but it's actually a very expensive pigment. And somebody gave me it as a gift, which is, which is um, sort of the main reason I ended up trying it. Um, and uh, it's very nice. I like it. I'm not sure if I'll, if I'll buy it on my own, but um, it, it, you know, I, I have a friend that swears by it. So, so, you know, um, and she's a great painter. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the ones that are kind of like wild cards like that, um, you know, will either by chance or just, you know, I think they're beautiful, you know, and, and so I, I pick them up, um, you, you know, and, and then I'll just try them out and see how they interact with those other colors. But, um, you know, for the most part, I, I, I like to keep things simple and, you know, I, I kind of, I don't want the, all, all these hurdles in my way before, um, before getting to the studio. And so if I have to put out like 30 different pigments, a lot of times um, it just becomes very frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I, I've just always, I think just, just naturally tried to simplify my palette as much as I could. Mm -hmm. Um but, but, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these extra colors too, like green gold, it, it becomes, it's a little redundant on the palette. Like, you know, I could, I could mix Indian yellow with a little bit of ultramarine and, and it's very, very close to what that's doing. You know, the, the green gold is a, is a transparent color also. So, um, so it's got, you know, it's got that going for it, but, you know, if I'm going to use that a lot in the half tones then you know, I could just go ahead and have, you know, um, I could just, I could even before I start premix like some, some, uh, Indian yellow into ultramarine and, but then, then before I start, I've got a premix. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's more convenient to just squeeze it out of the tube. And yeah. so, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I mean, the main thing, I think just building your palette around that, that core principle, red, yellow, and blue. And then I think with my palette, um, this wasn't intentional, but I, I think there, there is the a kind of like um, a, a lot of artists will have a warm and a cool of each one of those primaries. And so like a warm yellow and a cool yellow, a warm red and a cool red. Um, and that brings up temperature, which is, I, I, I kind of assume people, some, some people don't, don't get that very, very well intuitively. Um, but, you know, like, like, a, um, I mean, uh cadmium red would be a, a warm red you, you know uh elizabeth and crimson would be you know a, a cool. more cool red so yeah. as an example yeah um oh yeah, We're, yeah. we love i mean I, I always say we by the way because it's normally richard my co-host is usually here with me and he obsesses about this yeah. when talks about pr numbers pb numbers so it's very geeky oh okay well, there we go kind of, we love it <laughs> yeah. we love kind of talking about the nuances right. of color. Um, among friends yeah yeah I mean, yeah i i do too I, I think it's important to know because it is like that that does happen and especially if you're taking a, a a new class and there are certain recommendations on the on the um uh, materials list you know you might actually have some of those colors they're just called different things from different brands like you know um the crinacridone colors they'll call they'll, they'll have all these beautiful names for them rose blush and and stuff like that but um, you know, it's actually just like crinacridone magenta. And, um, and so you may already have a tube of it, you know? And so, um, yeah, it's sort of a useful thing to, to know, but yeah, we've had a reoccurring geeky. conversations about Indian yellow and how interesting that can be to mix because it's only takes a touch of another color and it completely, you know, yeah. changes into a really, uh, bright, you know, orange, if you, if you kind of do it, you know, a touch of red into it and, it doesn't take much to shift Indian yellow around. Has that been your experience or do you use it very lightly as a transparent or how was your work with it? Well, uh, I think I kind of use it as a modifier on those, on those more gray notes. And so, you know, if I, if I'm seeing something like um, in, in the half tones where I need to kind of warm it up or get a little more yellow, which, which would usually mean I, I need to cross it with a red or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
Uh, yeah, again, if I'm unless I'm painting like lemons or something like that, something already really brightly yellow, it's it's usually one of those colors I'll go to like towards the end where I'm trying to get that that really refined note. And and so, you know, I find if I if I can't get it with yellow ochre or or raw sienna or or something like that, but I I need to get a little more into the yellow um spectrum, you know, then it's either Indian yellow or the the um yellow lake or the transparent one the the more like you know green center yellow um and and so um so yeah i mean it's 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 really a modifier because because i i do find i mean the one i use and that's the other thing indian yellow from brand to brand is it can be a very different yellow um and so that's one that you want to check the pigment index um but the the one i use is uh, michael harding i i just found i like that one a lot um and and it's very powerful yellow so you know you do have to be kind of careful um, with that, but, but, uh, you know, I'll use it a lot in the darks, um, with, with ivory black or ultramarine and, and another red as well. So that, 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 that keeps, I, I can mix up kind of a, a neutral dark either and even control a little bit of the temperature and hue, um, by the ratios. Um, but you know, it, 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 like it would keep ivory black from going too cool if it starts to get you know, some titanium in there, you're moving into the half tones, you know, and you want to keep it more rich and warm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so I actually will use a lot more in the darks to start out with. Um, and then obviously like, um, yellow ochre would be a great example of that kind of yellow, a, a not transparent pigment, you know, an opaque pigment that if I were to mix yellow ochre with ivory black, you know, I'd have a, a mid tone value, but if I mix Indian yellow with ivory black, it's, it stays, you know, I mean, it, it still even looks black before it's mixed with, with any other opaque note. And so, um, yeah, just another example. Very interesting. For the transparency Probably. thing. Is this anything that you have the opportunity yeah. to teach or is this beyond what you, what you teach as far as this level of color theory? Do you get into this with students? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, if, I, if it's a painting class, um, you know, we're, we'll do a lot of color studies and, mm -hmm. and so I'll, I mean, I'll talk all about, you know, how I try and just simplify the, the everything to begin with, you, you know, I mean, usually I, I, what I try and do is going back to, you know, what I'd said earlier, like if I can just squint my eyes and look at what I'm painting and simplify that into the three or four biggest notes that I see, you know, if, if I can mix those notes, like get really good at mixing those notes, then, I mean, that's like, that's most of the painting, you know, that's done now. I mean, of course that's harder than it sounds, but um, you know, like most, most days I go in the studio, I would say just about every day is, you know, I'll, I'll start by mixing up, even if I'm working on a painting, I've been working on it for a month, you know, I'll start by remixing those big notes because usually it's like a background, you know, it's kind of a, a general sort of base for the figure or whatever the, you know, if it's a still life, you, you know, whatever one of the, um, the, the subjects is, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, pick, pick two others. I mean, there's usually a couple other big spots. Um, and I mean, I like compositions that kind of lend themselves to that as well, that, you know, that are, are pretty simple um, for the most part. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you get good at mixing those notes and so, so I, I think a lot of the conversation with students will, will just be, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you simplify color mixing? You know, how do you approach that? How do you, how do you get three good notes set up to start to read? Um, and, and then, um, you know, all the strategies that, that I, I try and use for that sort of thing, because I mean, it's, it's a lot of, in, in your head, it's a lot of troubleshooting and, and so, you know, when I'm teaching, I just, I just try to talk kind of like what I'm doing right now. I just talk out loud that, con that inner commentary yeah. and just let it go and, and hope it's not, you know, annoying or rambling or whatever. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that, I think that definitely will, will come in to, to play a lot. And, and yeah, of course, any, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be talking a lot about the pigments I use and why I use them and, and um, certain pitfalls that you have, but, but there's really no substitute for actually, you know, taking those and mixing them. And just like with the, with the lead white versus titanium, I mean, you'd, you'd really just need to, to play around with it yourself to, to see, you know, what, what I'm really talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but a little guidance, of course, is always, is always good too. Yeah. Know. No, it sounds good. I mean, it sounds good as far as, the opportunity to talk so in depth about colors to students but you mentioned composition and that was going to be 
the next question I was going to ask is, is there anything that you can kind of share with the audience about any kind of tips on composition as far as your understanding of it? Because I've heard different things from different artists of how to approach composition. Is there anything which you, you've kind of relied upon or found to be, um, I don't know, kind of true, I suppose? Yeah. Well, I, that, I think that is, I, I, composition is one of the hardest things to, for, for me, I mean, especially teaching it, because I, I do think that inevitably there's a lot of taste involved, like personal taste involved. Um, and, and so, you know, what, what, um, I, I guess the, the, the first advice I would give or the thing that, um, that I think is, is very helpful is just to, um, collect your influences. I mean, what are the things that when you look at, you know, that um, just a, a, the visual images that, you know, kind of resonate with you the most, they impact you the most, that you're most drawn towards. Um, and that could be painting, you know, that could be um, film, you know, cinematography, you know, it could be, it could be tons of different things. Um, but, you know, starting to kind of pay attention to those things and, you um, and then, you know, you can, you can kind of be a little more analytical about it and, and try and think about, you know, what, what they're doing if, if, you know, if it, if it looks like they're doing something. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I mean, to, to me, what, like I always, in, in my paintings, you know, so I, I mentioned, you know, like starting with the rectangle. Um, one of the first things I'll do is I'll, I'll draw the center line for that rectangle. And, and then, you know, it becomes a question of like, how are sort of the central objects in this motif going to interact with these axes of, of the, of the, the central uh, axes of, of the rectangle. Um, but that what, what you're also getting from that, it not only does it give you the center, which is obviously a very salient thing, you know, in, in a, in a composition, um, but it's dividing it into different quadrants. And so, um, so I kind of mentioned, you know, I like having paintings with just a few big shapes and, and it, it's kind of a question of like how how much um, to leverage, you know, negative space and and you know areas that are more charged with positive space, and you know what kind of dynamic that creates within the rectangle. Um, and but a, a lot of that I think is just based on you know the things I I like I think are visually interesting. You know, I love uh, Japanese prints, for instance, which um, you know they do a lot with asymmetry, and and it's it's very compared to Western art. You know, it's a very um, unconventional kind of way of, of composing. Um, but, you know, I love Western painting as well. Obviously, you know, my, I'm kind of, I'm grounded in that to a large extent. And so, you know, a familiarity with like the, the more traditional ways, you know, like the, like the triangle, you know, or a pyramid sort of thing, like the Virgin enthroned, you know, I mean, you, you got like a hundred thousand of those in Western art history. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there's, there are conventional compositional things that I think are very good to be aware of because, you know, when you, um, when you kind of subvert that or play around with that, it, it can become, you know, even more interesting. Um, but, but I, I do think in the end, I, you know, because it, it can become, it, it's such a rabbit hole and, and, you know, it can be so overwhelming the whole, the whole subject of composition that, you know, ultimately just going back to, you know, what I was saying you know, that all that really matters is that it looks good, you know, that it, it it's exciting to you. And, and, um, you know, to, I think to kind of exhaust all the options you have, I mean, especially early on doing little thumbnail studies. I mean, there are all kinds of strategies you can have to looking for that composition. That's going to be the most exciting one. Um, but, but even that, I mean, you, you know, I could spend, a very long time trying to figure out what the absolute best composition is. And the way my brain works is I'll just, I'll, I'll become obsessed and confused and, and just um, kind of paralyzed um, at, at all the different options. You know, could I, I could get up and move around the room. I mean, what's the best angle to paint this thing? Um, you know, there, there, it becomes so overwhelming that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's good also to have strategies to just, you know, keep it simple and, and not, um, not overwhelm yourself, but, but the, 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 uh, I, I mean, I do, I do think that um, the thing about having these influences or, you know, looking at this, this is another thing that I, sometimes I have trouble 
um, with students because I, I encourage this in, in my classes, especially if it's a class that um, kind of uh, that is is intending to uh, work, discuss composition more more prominently. Um, that you know, I'll, I'll try and get them to start to sort of stockpile these influences. You know, like 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 who do you like? What name name an artist that you that you know you really love? Um, and and a lot of people don't don't even have artists. You know, like not not off the top of their head at least. And um, and so you know, I think that's that's kind of the thing that would be. It's just so important to to look at other paintings or 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 yeah like movies you know things that um that you think are beautiful that you know that you want some of those qualities in your work um and and then you know and then it's just a matter of, of trying to you know trying to put them in there right and so um so that that i think having influences is, is a big one you know um yeah, yeah that's great yeah that's a great it's similar to there's a chap called uh um, John Mahoney, who I interviewed, who's a former Disney artist. So it's more illustration turned fine art, but lovely guy. Great, yeah. great talker. He's actually a bit of a filmmaker these days. And um, his advice was very similar. He said, you know, take what your influence is or something which you know is compositionally sound. And his example was Ben Hur. And he said, take screenshots and have a page full of screenshots, which are minimized so that you can see them in thumbnail yeah. form and then sketch out the composition and just have it written into your head so that those are now yeah. basic shapes that are just kind of becoming muscle memory to the extent where you can have this uh, instinct for what works and what is imbalanced and if the imbalance serves the picture or not. So it's it's a lovely, as you said, kind of complex topic, but I always like to see if I can... Right. Uh, yeah, kind of challenge a guest to sort of say, what are your thoughts on that? How do we, how do we maneuver on this? I mean, I think that's, uh, it's, it's one of the most important things because, you know, once, and especially nowadays, you know, wherever you go, really, um, I, I mean, there, there are a lot of these schools that are opening where you, you can get the skill set that you need pretty easily um, to, if you're, if, again, if you're working kind of observationally and, and you want to kind of learn how to draw and paint that way, um, but but I mean, the the composition question, that's where, you know, so much of your individuality and personal expression and all of that is going to come through. Um, and and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's excellent advice. And, and actually, like illustrators are 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 I think they they get that way earlier, at least in my experience, than than a lot of like fine art painters um, did. And and so, you know, they have great advice for, you know, how to how to just how to get better. Um, with with compositional things so that I mean like doing thumbnails but then like he said you know even even with paintings you know look at look at Vermeer's mm. Vermeer paintings as as thumbnails and you know don't get too caught up with the the technique and and how beautifully rendered it is but you know just look at the big shapes the way he formats these things the way he, he uses that to to move your eye around in a composition I mean Titian you know, it's just it would be endless to to look at. Um, I mean, any any uh, Western art. Look at, like I said, Japanese prints. You know, I mean, the the kind of dynamic that these shapes create are are. Um, I mean, that's the real the thing. You know, that you're that you're studying, and then the thing that you're trying to get in your own work is that it has this kind of dynamic to it that that you find appealing, and that you know that you want to share with other people. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it's it's one of the one of the most important things I think um, to to think about, but uh, very difficult to also yeah. to to yeah yeah teach no, that's great. It's it's kind of it's true. It's it's a it's a great conversation though, and it's an interesting um, subject to broach. But if I could, I'd like to ask you now about where you exhibit your work because I've seen that there's a couple of galleries linked on your Instagram. So. Do you want to tell us about the galleries? Because we're trying to encourage people to support the guest as well. And to, if you're in the area, to go and visit the gallery, purchase the work or, you know, look you up online. So which which galleries do you exhibit in? Uh, so right now I have uh, some work at a gallery uh, overseas in Cornwall in the UK um, called Tregony Contemporary. Um, and I think they actually have a show coming up called primary colors or maybe it's open now um and i've been showing with them for for a few years now 
Um, and, and then I also have some work at a gallery called Mary Warner gallery, which is in uh, West Palm beach, Florida. And, um, and so, yeah, both of those are linked on my, on my social media. Um, and, and I, I, I mean, I, I also, I mean, I'll, I'll, any group shows that come up, you know, I, I, I like to participate in those. Um, and, and so, you know, I've, I've kind of exhibited in other places just, just to that extent. Um, but, but nothing coming up for that right now. Um, and so that's sort of, that's, that's, that's basically all I've got as far as official, official gallery, um, involvement. Um, it's an interesting and, story. yeah, please, you know, yeah, it's an interesting uh, yeah, well, I, <laughs> I mean, that would be, that would be a whole other kind of conversation about, um, how to get in galleries or pursue galleries or, um, you know, um, to court galleries, but, uh, you know, basically I, I, I have a, so my social media account, which that's a whole other podcast too. But, um, you know, some of these galleries had, had approached me or, or like a, a, a friend or a student, you know, kind of recommended me. Um, and, and that's sort of how that went. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, I, and, and then of course I'm very happy working with them and, and I've had a good experience working with them. And so I keep sending them work. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's all kind of a mystery to me, like how to, you know, how to, um, get, get into other galleries or even, even pursue that sort of thing. But it's, it's just, it's so interesting with social media, it sort of opens up, you know, the, the world to us in a way, which is, which is very valuable. I mean, I, I can remember, um, talking with, with older painters who, you know, they used to have to get slides processed and then they have to get it all printed and like they, they'd send, you know, hard copies to galleries. And I mean, there's this whole process that, um, Fortunately, you know, um, you know, we don't have to worry about nowadays. But yeah, we've streamlined that um, massively. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if you would come on again in the future, I'd love for you to be a guest when Richard is here because sure. he'd love to talk to you as well. He's and someone who teaches all the time. Definitely. He'd he'd love to get into color with you and teaching, and and he loves those conversations. And I can tell there's loads more questions I could ask you, but this is at a point where I'm going to wrap up and say. Where should people go to support you as far as online? Do you have a website? Is there any other social media or is it predominantly Instagram? Where, where would you like people to go? Well, I do, I do have a, I mean, I have a website and it's just, I think it's David T Um, and, and yeah, I, um, I am on Instagram. Um, and, uh, if you go to my website, it'll, it'll all link up through there. I, I, I'm not sure, um, it would make sense to spell out my username or if I even remember it right now, but maybe screen. you can search me and I would show up, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 um, I, I do a lot on Instagram or I mean, I don't do a lot on Instagram, but, but that's the most I do on social media. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, my, my, my posts are kind of sporadic, but, um, I, I hope they're of decent quality, you know, when they are, get, when oh, they do yeah. get posted, but yeah, that, I mean, that's, a, it is a, it, I mean, it's a, it's a whole other kind of thing. Um, you know, actually doing that. And I mean, again, not as bad as, as getting slides um, <laughs> done and all that, but um, yeah, it, it can be, uh, it can be kind of overwhelming s somewhat, but so, so I try and keep it simple. I, I have Instagram and, and uh, website for now and maybe Facebook, if you feel like looking up there, but don't expect much activity. <laughs> well, don't expect much activity from any of them, but um Yeah. Well, regardless, um, I mean, I encourage every viewer and listener to go and uh, look up David's work because it's beautiful. I was really drawn to it, and this is why uh, I reached out to you because I, I just love your work. I think it's amazing colors, really interesting uh, compositions, and it's uh, beautiful work. And I'm going to put all the links in the description of this video and in the description of the podcast channels, so Spotify or uh, Apple um, Podcasts or wherever you get this podcast there will be links in the description to go and see david's work to see the galleries where he exhibits and to support him which we encourage everyone to do but i just want to yeah thank you very much for being on the podcast you've been a fantastic guest yeah thanks for having me that was a great conversation happy to come back so thank you very much <laughs>
Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you can support the podcast by leaving a like or a comment down below, that would really be great. But what we'd really like is if you're able to leave a review on the podcast channels, wherever you listen to it or download it, because that helps us get spread around the internet so that more people have access to us and able to see what we're making. Also, follow us on Instagram, and we'd really appreciate it if you like and engage with our posts. Help get the podcast better known. Thanks for listening.